Hi, my name is Jen Balava. I'm a naturalist with the Burlington County Park System. The following is a presentation I made to educate the residents of Burlington County about the beneficial insects around their yards. As spring is underway, more insects will start emerging and people are likely to kill or spray insects if they don't know what they are. Therefore, this presentation was meant to provide a visual aid to the general public so that they are aware of what many of our common types of beneficial insects look like so that they're less likely to be harmed. Over the years when I've asked both students and adults in the park programs that I run what their favorite insect is and why, I have only really gotten three responses. Butterflies because they have pretty wings and look nice. Dragonflies because they have pretty colors and have cool wings and ladybugs because they can't hurt you and have pretty colors. Hopefully this presentation and the information provided in it will change people's perspectives on why these insects are truly important and beneficial, not just for their pretty colors. Unfortunately, insects have a negative connotation to most people. Of the millions of insect species on Earth, only a very small percentage interact with humans in negative ways. The remainder provide very important services and roles in the environment, including pollination, the recycling of nutrients, predatory insects keeping other pest populations in check, aerating and enriching the soil, and providing food either directly or indirectly for most animals. They maintain structure and stability in the natural world that would otherwise exist in constant chaos. As E.O. Wilson said, they're really the little things that run the world. I'm going to start off with the predatory insects that keep other insect populations in check. Many of these insects may look scary or threatening, but pose no threat to people. They provide a free service worth at least $4.5 billion in U.S. agricultural control of pests annually. They include ladybugs, praying mantis, ambush bugs, certain ground beetles, lacewings, dragonflies, and many species of small wasps. In fact, tiny predaceous and parasitic wasps account for 60% of all insect predation on other insects. Insects go through metamorphosis as they grow, and the vast majority of insects look very different in the larva and pupa stage as compared to the adult stage of their life cycle. So first we're going to start with a look at the ladybugs and their life cycle. As you can see, the ladybug larvae are long and segmented and definitely do not resemble the familiar adult ladybug at all. But these larvae eat just as many, if not more, pests like aphids and mites as their adult counterparts. Because they may look intimidating, people are likely to squish them, and we definitely don't want that. You can also see the pupa, or resting stage, pictured here on the bottom, and then finally the adult. There are many different kinds of lacewings, but for the most part, adult lacewings are nocturnal and feed mostly on things like nectar and pollen. So it's the lacewing larvae that are definitely the most beneficial and eat a lot of different kinds of pests. They're even known as aphid lions or aphid wolves because of the enormous amount of aphids they can eat in a day. The lacewing larvae are long and segmented and have pincers near their mouth for grabbing prey. So they can definitely look intimidating and kind of scary, but they pose no harm to people. Of all commercially available predators, the lacewing is the most voracious and has the greatest versatility for pests of field crops, orchards, and greenhouses. Amazingly, the lacewing larvae can camouflage themselves by putting bits of lichen on their bodies, as you can see in the top center photo. So they can walk up and down trees looking for prey undetected and also hide from predators like birds. 
If you see a piece of lichen walking or moving on a tree trunk, it's likely a lacewing larva. Certain kinds of ground beetles are general predators of insects. The one you see in the top left feeds primarily on caterpillars that attack trees and shrubs, and they're usually found in the leaf litter. Here we can see examples of tiger beetles. You can see the overall shape of a tiger beetle. There's so many different species that are found in Burlington County. While they can fly, they stay close to the ground. These ground beetles, again, feed on many different kinds of insects in general, but close to the ground. And then we have the soldier beetle. Soldier beetles, which are very important predators of aphids and mealybugs and other kinds of pests. Interestingly enough, the soldier beetles are doubly beneficial. In their larval stage, they eat many different soft-bodied insects underground that can be pests. And then in the adult stage, they also visit flowers for nectar and can act as pollinators. They're most attracted to white flowers, especially in the early fall. Praying mantis species of all kinds are general predators of insects and spiders. We have one native species and two non-native species of praying mantis in New Jersey. All of them are predatory. Next we have bald-faced hornets. These are common in our area and it's important to recognize them from other insects. They make a gray pendant shaped paper mache looking nest from wood fibers that they mix with their saliva. If you leave them and their nest alone, they will leave you alone. But if you try to attack or spray them or harm them in any way, they will definitely attack and sting aggressively. We have these in trees all throughout our county parks, and no one really seems to notice them until the leaves fall off the trees, and then people complain and want them removed. When in fact, the whole year long, they were not a problem to anyone because they were left alone. If you have these on the side of your house or other kind of occupied dwelling, then you should definitely have them professionally removed. Otherwise, let them be. These insects are doubly beneficial. In spring and summer, these hornets will bring in various uh, kinds of insect protein, mostly in the form of flies and yellow jackets, which they will feed to their young. The adults also drink flower nectar and can act as pollinators of some plants. Cicada killers are a type of wasp that feed on cicadas. They do not harm people or sting pets. They are often confused with the European hornet, which I've shown below. It has a lot more yellow on its abdomen. They uh, can sting people, so it's important to know the difference. The insects seen here are all examples of different species of assassin bugs. These are ambush predators that lie in wait and then pounce on their prey. And then they stab them with their sharp mouth part and then suck out the insides of the insect like a straw. They do not harm people or pets. They prey on insects. Another kind of ambush predator are the robber flies. Robber flies have a long, extended, pointed abdomen, very different from other flies. They will either lie in wait or pursue their prey in flight. They especially like to eat biting flies. Like the assassin bugs, they do still stab their prey with their mouth part and then suck the insides out. They do not harm people or pets. This photo of a goldenrod ambush bug shows how camouflaged they can be as they wait for their prey to land on the flower. It's really only from one side angle that you can see that the bug is revealed. Just amazing camouflage. 
Dragonflies and damselflies are really important predators of mosquitoes and other kinds of biting pests in both the nymph and adult parts of their life cycle. So dragonflies and their skinnier cousins, the damselflies, start out as aquatic nymphs in various types of water bodies underwater, eating mosquito larvae and fly larvae. And then when they emerge as adults, they eat those insect pests on land. So they're really, truly, extremely beneficial predators. Well, as you can see, predatory and parasitic wasps are a very, very diverse group of insects. Predatory wasps are normally larger than the parasitic wasps. Most females will sting their prey, paralyze them, and then move them per, to a protected specific place where their young are to feed their larvae. Whereas the parasitic wasps, where the, this, in this case, the females will insert their eggs into the host, usually the larval stage, but there are some that can attack any stage of an insect's life cycle. In general, the larva of flies, beetles, butterflies, moths, scorpion flies, caddis flies, fleas, and even other hymenoptera like wasps and bees are all attacked by different kinds of parasitic wasps. These photos show examples of predatory wasps. These are again relatively large and you can see here she is stinging the caterpillar prey just to paralyze it and then bringing it back to her burrow to feed her young. Examples of parasitic wasps. So again they're stinging their prey, but what they're doing is they're inserting their eggs inside. So those eggs will develop into larvae, which will feed on the host, and then eventually develop into pupa. In many cases, you'll see white fuzzy pupa on the outside of various caterpillars, as you can see in this picture on the right. They will prey on a lot of different garden pests that eat a lot of our uh, garden vegetables. So these are our beneficial uh, to leave in your garden if you see something like this. Tachinid flies also parasitize various kinds of caterpillars that many of which we consider pests such as cutworms and armyworms and, and gypsy moths and sawflies and things like that. So they lay their eggs inside those caterpillars and then the young will develop inside. The flies are attracted mostly to various kinds of asters and you can see uh, pictures of them here. Moving on to our next group, the recyclers. These include dung beetles, burying beetles, sow bugs, which are actually not insects, they're crustaceans, springtails, and ants. So here are some photos of the insects I just mentioned. Dung beetles will actually roll dung in a straight line despite obstacles. They can roll up to 50 times their weight on average. They bury the dung underground. The females lay their eggs inside it and then the larva will develop inside and feed on undigested plant material within the dung. Uh, you can see in the bottom left a photo of a springtail. These are wingless insects that can jump. They are round and soft-bodied instead of dark brown and flattened like fleas. Springtails have normal hind legs whereas fleas have hind legs modified for jumping. And then you can see a photo of uh, a sow bug. These are all examples of, of creatures that are considered recyclers. So these insects improve nutrient recycling, development and formation of the soil, both the soil's physical and chemical properties and the maintenance of the soil community as a whole. They protect livestock by removing habitat for flies 
So dung beetles save the U.S. cattle industry an estimated $380 million a year just by burying livestock feces. Ants are very important recyclers of nutrients, and in the process, they, they make very vast underground tunnels and aerate the soil. The ants will then move organic matter from above ground to below ground, where they shred it for further processing by bacteria and fungi. And therefore, it can be recycled and turned into very, very rich soil. They're also very important dispersers of seeds. In fact, more than 3,000 species of plants and 70 families use ants to transport their seeds. And that includes many of our spring wildflowers. So spring ephemerals are those that bloom very early in the year before the forest leaves out and blocks out their sun. They have a special uh, seed pod like you see here with the blood root which is allowed to sh shape to allow ants to grab it. And this particular pod is called an eliosome, and the seed contains an oil that's really attractive to ants. So the ants will come and they'll take that pod and they will basically take it away from the parent plant and spread it in a nice pile of compost. So. A lot of plants are also protected by their association with ant nests because not many things want to mess with an ant colony. And these are all examples of our early spring wildflowers that have ants transporting their seeds. There are examples, especially among the pea family, where ants will form a partnership with the plant. So there's a small nectar gland at the base of each leaf that the plant produces and attracts ant species. And they in turn will protect the plant from herbivores and anything that tries to eat the plant. These kinds of examples of partnerships between ants and plants exist in many other parts of the world. For instance, a single acacia tree in Africa may contain more than 30,000 ants to protect it. Now let's take a look at our insect pollinators. They include bees, wasps, butterflies, moths, some species of flies, and some types of small beetles. A very conservative estimate is that at least 80% of the world's flowering plants are pollinated by animals. In our area, that's these insects. So here you see examples of butterflies, berries, beetles, flies. These are all pollinators. And here is a clear wing sphinx moth. This is uh, a moth that kind of looks like a, a bumblebee or a hummingbird. It's a daytime moth. It beats its wings so fast that they actually do resemble hummingbirds in flight. These are also pollinators. On this slide, we see examples of bees and wasps. So bees are generally wider and fuzzier, whereas the wasps have a sort of pinched in waist between the thorax and the abdomen. And they have, in general, less fuzz on their bodies. Uh, so if we compare these to that of the honeybee, which you see here, Honeybee is good to be able to recognize as well as the bumblebee from some of these other wasps, particularly the yellow jacket, because those the yellow jacket is definitely the most one of the most aggressive and will sting over and over, whereas a honeybee can only sting once and it dies. It's definitely a last ditch uh, effort to save the colony from disturbance. So basically, if you leave these uh, bees alone, they'll leave you alone. The majority of the bee species in our area are actually solitary bees that do not have a stinger. There's no reason to. They don't have a, a hive to defend. 
they nest singly in holes in the ground, as you can see here. And most of them are active right now in the early spring, making these little sand mounds in the ground. These solitary bees are very important pollinators of many of our early wildflowers and some of our spring crops. Honeybees are bees that were brought here from Europe in the 1600s with the European settlers, and they are now indispensable part of our agricultural food supply. They are responsible for pollinating about a third of our food, which actually comes out to be more than 100 different types of crops. Unfortunately, honeybees, like a lot of other kinds of pollinators right now, are declining very rapidly. Honeybees are undergoing colony collapse disorder, which continues to kill honeybees in very large numbers every year. What happens with this is that basically their immune system is compromised as a result of many different factors, but mostly uh, chlorinated nicotine pesticides, known as neonicotinoids, which makes them susceptible to other naturally occurring infections. So as I just mentioned, honeybees are undergoing colony collapse disorder. Our native bumblebees are susceptible to exotic fungal diseases. This is due to mainly being raised commercially for greenhouse pollination. Bumblebees are transported far and wide across North America and Europe. And the global trade in domesticated bumblebees for crop pollination, such as tomatoes and peppers, has resulted in the introduction of a non-native parasite from Europe. So the stressed out bumblebees often carry these deadly parasites in their guts, which they then pass on to native wild bumblebees. And so if you take all these things into account, the exposure uh, to these insects of various cocktail of different types of insecticides combined with, of course, habitat loss. There's no reason to wonder why pollinators are in such decline. So in conclusion, you could see that all of these beneficial insects that we just mentioned are providing five basic free services, pollination, recycling of nutrients, improvement of the soil by aeration. The predators are taking care of pests, keeping other insects in check, and their food for other animals. So if you take all of these things, you can see that Altogether, they help the, a garden function as a natural system. And the more diversity of native plants we have in our gardens, the more complex biological interactions we have of all these different beneficial insects, and therefore more stability. So you can help attract beneficial insects to your garden simply by planting flowers with nectar, and the more shapes, colors, and different seasonal bloom times of the flowers, the more kinds of insects will be attracted. Now this is true for native plants only because our non-native plants are, are often modified so that they no longer have pollen and nectar for pollinators. Ground nesters like the solitary bees require small patches of bare ground, undisturbed soil. Sandy areas or mossy areas are, are good spots for ground nesting bees. And then we have the wood nesters. So we have some insects that use plant stems that are hollow or a dead trunk, things like this. You can hang blocks of wood with holes in them, and that will keep some of the wood nesters, like carpenter bees, off of your furniture, deck, etc. These are all beneficial pollinators that we don't want to kill. Uh, mud 
pebbles, plant fibers, plant resins, these all serve to benefit those that build mud nests. So these are all good things to leave in your yard. And then of course they need a water source. And this could be in the form of a pond, a puddle. The most useful is a shallow saucer as these are more useful to insects. They're not as deep as a bird bath, which is pretty much too deep for most insects to drink from. But even moist sand or muddy areas is good too. These are examples of insect hotels for native, native cavity nesting bees to live in. The key with these is that they must have a door or some kind of hinge that allows you to remove the nesting material and put new material in once the young bees have emerged in the usually in the springtime. If you leave the old material inside, then you can actually do more harm than good since the holes can develop fungus, which is lethal to the developing insects. So look for ones that can be opened in the back. Uh, if you look at the one, the picture on the right, this is an example of the insect hotel that was built by an Eagle Scout at Longbridge Park in Hainesport. And you can see we actually used a lot of the invasive reeds right from the meadow as nesting material for the native bees. It's pretty cool. And this is how not to attract beneficial insects by using broad scale synthetic pesticides that can either directly poison them or indirectly kill them by killing off their prey and the host they need for their offspring. And also by planting only non-native plants that our native insects cannot use. So I want to end with this really fantastic quote This is from Chris Davies, a member of the European Parliament in the UK. And he said, protecting the environment isn't just about the big visible changes like the melting ice in Greenland or the pollution in our atmosphere. It's also about protecting the tiny creatures who keep our plants growing in our world running. So with that, I hope that this presentation has been a helpful guide to recognizing both beneficial insects, and the roles they play in the environment. Please do your part to ensure that our beneficial insects are not harmed unnecessarily and can continue to provide all these free services for us. Feel free to share this video link with others, but please do not copy or download copyrighted images. Thank you for watching.